Hello and a very happy new year. Welcome to Warford Weekly, your EastEnders podcast. This week discussing the episodes broadcast between the 28th of December to the 1st of January. My name is Rob, one segment of the discarded chocolate orange that is your hosting team. And joining me, a man so witty and intelligent he makes squiggles look like she failed all her GCSEs. It's little Alex Osborne. Hello, Alex. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, lovely intro. Thank you. Your intros for me are always so kind. Always. Gotta keep you on your toe. Shall we do some news quick? Uh, John Sen had been doing the rounds around the press junkets and released a few statements about stories that are up and coming in 2021. He keeps drumming home that he's got a, he's got a plan 2021. He's got it all mapped out uh, like he did with Jags, as we know. You know, he had Jags' story arc from beginning to end all ready to go <laughs> and fulfilled it perfectly. <laughs> the hula hoops were on pre-order. <laughs> I'm going to mention... Two or three of the stories that don't link up with stories that happened this week. And then I might inject a few of John Sen's comments throughout the stories we'll discuss that happened this week as well. So just to give you a warning right now, there might be a few spoilers here and there that you might hear, but nothing major. They're not, they're, I mean, I'm not telling you the story of Christmas 2021, so it's nothing too bad. The first story he mentioned was that he's going to get Lola and Isaac hooked up together. I mean, no surprises there really, is there? Phil would think about that since Phil was grasped Isaac and doesn't really have a lot of respect, doesn't really care for Isaac very much. Does he, do you reckon he'd be very happy that he could potentially be the father of his grand daughter um not that Lola's the marrying type to be fair exactly (laughs) um I doubt he'll remember to be honest um how much discussion is there to be pulled out of characters like Lola and Isaac at the moment oh I know that's what I mean it seems such a shame that they kind of these two characters that have nothing to do let's hope so I mean a lot of the stories that John Sen has mentioned in this these articles have been for very much characters that haven't had a lot of airtime this year in 2020 so it's nice to see that he's actually putting background characters to use of a better term back to the forefront Mm. he said something along the lines of there'll be characters that we might not expect getting together which always makes me nervous when i see producers saying (laughs) um yeah i'm i'm open to ideas you know 2021 feels like should be an interesting year to start off with so bring it on i mean like i say i feel that isaac and lola are going to be quite down on the uh electric storyline list but i live to be surprised He's putting Tiff, Keegan and Dottie together into number 25 because Sonia, she's having a bit of a rest um, from the soap. From the NHS. <laughs> well, from, from everything. Um, yeah. So they're kind of putting them all together as a unit together. They tried it once with Habiba, Tina and Ikra. Kind of just got forgotten and then they all kind of split up and went their own ways. Uh, so it seems like they're trying it again, just this time with Keegan, Tiff and Dottie. I'm trying to make them kind of like a friendship group that are young, so they're kind of... You know what I mean? They're kind of... Yeah, yeah. They're, they're going to have money issues. They're going to have young people issues. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> young people problems. Yeah, they're not going to... There's no jobs out there for them. They're not going to have a lot of money. They're all trying to scrimp and save and trying to find their place in life, you know? Yeah, I mean, I would say... I think that Dottie is a great character. So I'm really looking forward to seeing more from her this year. And I think already, seeing the, the two different set of young characters you did there, you know, when you've got Tiffany, Keegan and Dottie and then putting on a separate list to Bieber, Ikra and whoever the other one was. One Tina. Sounds a lot more, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One sounds a lot more exciting than the other. I <laughs> know, oh, I agree with you. I think this is a much better group than what did they did we have a thing where dotty felt like she was after keegan at one point last year yes they did i don't know if it was last year it was the year before i think it was it was a long time ago yeah, <laughs> she yeah she did it because it was when dotty first it was when dotty first came back um her and tiff they remembered that oh, <laughs> dotty yes. put tiff in the bin and uh it was like oh you know when we were kids you used to you know wind each other up and so she kind of did it as a kind of nod as when they were kids they used to be a bit mischievous together and Mm. yeah Dottie continued it yeah so I think it was over a year ago but I hope that's not what they're planning to do no but I'd be quite happy to uh sort of bring back that whole uh rivalry that Tiff and Dottie had when they were kids um another story is that they're continuing Stacey and Ruby's feud which we which moves us in very nicely to the stories of the week Ruby has been has got very upset because Martin seems to be getting closer to Stacey Ruby wants to have a child uh with Martin completely omitting everything Ruby was at the beginning of the year which was she's not the marrying type she does want kids to tie her 
down. She's a career woman. She wants to look after number one, which is herself. She wants to swing. She wants to have sex with lots of different men and women. And now she wants to settle down, get married, have kids. And uh, just all all to spite Stacey. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing is, that's what I think all of that, all of that boils down to. She just wants to sort of nail Martin down and she's prepared to do absolutely anything to make sure that Stacey doesn't have him. I think it's even about Martin. I think it's more about just getting back at Stacey. As soon as she realised, because I, th- I think that once Ruby would to get herself into that situation of being married with, with Martin from the market store, I think she'd get bored very quickly. Do you think? Because I think, I think that so. w- when Martin and Ruby were together, she they, they seem to have a, quite a fiery relationship and I don't, I can't get any indication that that has stopped happening it's just that now stacy's back she's kind of getting in the way of the commitment that martin once had for ruby like uh. martin never really forgave stacy for the kind of madness that she put him under when she went away got together with someone came back wound him up kind of you know he she really wound martin down uh, but now they're beginning to build that relationship back up between them ruby's getting very jealous I just I think it's a shame that Ruby thinks that the only way the only way she can get Martin's attention is with a child and Martin has said no, I don't want another about. child, <laughs> which and she, she should be pleased him, really. about. No, I would, I wouldn't blame him. He's either. already got about thirteen at this point, so I think it's it's probably a good job that he's saying no to that. Really, <laughs> and now Ruby is trying to hurt. Stacy and Martin, mm. but thinking that it's going to bring them closer together by I... paying Kush to kidnap Arthur. Yeah, that was nuts. Um, I can see her, I can see Ruby sort of like faking a pregnancy or something just to kind of keep Martin there. Yeah, but then that's that's not the right route to take, surely, because Martin has already said that he doesn't want another kid. Do you think yeah, Martin? But that's not. It's not her. It's not necessarily her. Her fault if they don't take the necessary precautions, or a precaution fails, or or something like that. It's, I think it's easy enough to uh, fake something. I think she's. I don't think that Ruby necessarily care. I mean, yes, yeah, she does care about Martin. I think she loves Martin, but I do think that she's more fueled by this little rivalry with Stace than she is. I, I say I think that if she had Martin with absolutely no issues whatsoever I think she'd get bored if it's all about sex and it's all about sort of ripping each other's clothes off and having instant fiery chemistry all the time her initial relationship with Max I would have thought would have scratched that itch fairly well because obviously you know what no matter what you might think of Max he is he's got experience so um yeah but he I was thought, he was he was worn down by exactly <laughs> Ruby so by the end of it about so, Martin, yeah but Martin's a much younger much, lad he is a very much younger <laughs> lad, but I think at the same time, he is also, you know, Ruby owns a club. She's very sort of quite happy to sit there got sipping champers and multimillionaire and all of that sort of thing. Compared to Martin, who's, he's Martin Fowler, son of Pauline and Alpha. He's very sort of earthy and down to earth and all that sort of thing. And in the long run, how entertained is Ruby going to be? And how much longevity do they actually have as a couple compared to flighty Ruby, compared to quite happy just to sit in front of the telly with a beer and watch the chase or something, Martin. <laughs> but why but why then would Ruby be so desperate to keep hold of him? If if these are like the reasons that Ruby wouldn't stay with Martin, because Martin is the market seller, you know, mm. chip off the mum and dad's block, you mm. know, very much Wolford. Why is Ruby so desperate to keep hold of him other than to spite Stacey? Is is has Stacey hurt Ruby that much that Ruby feels like she, <laughs> that she needs to hurt? Uh, essentially Martin and Stacy by doing having their child kidnapped from them and I and I also just all about Stace what's Stacy really done to Ruby really it's a pride thing though isn't it with Ruby mm. it's a pride thing it's the fact that a Stacy betrayed her and I think in Johnny da- Johnny Allen's daughter's eyes that's a big thing because we occasionally get these little flashes of psychopathy flashing through Ruby's eyes whenever she looks at a photo of her father I know I loved, I loved that she had a photo of her father on the desk <laughs> just and it, standing there yeah, yeah. and she yeah she does as you say there's a kind of a, a glimpse of her trying to fulfil her father's uh, shoes we are literally I think about two episodes away from her walking through the square in the middle of the night and Johnny Allen's face appearing in the clouds and telling her that, <laughs> reminding her that he's, uh, he's her daughter <laughs> I, can, I can't see Ruby wanting to stay with someone like like Martin forever. I think that once that initial period of how good he is in bed or whatever has passed, and he's and she's just left with Martin Fowler off the market, she would get bored. And the first exciting fiery man that came along into her life that she felt she was better suited to, she dumped Martin really quickly. Mm. I'm not denying that she thinks she loves him at the moment, but I think that. That isn't something that would last forever. She's fighting tooth and nail to keep Martin at the moment, though. And mm. as I said, she 
got she's paid Kush off. Kush has accepted the money. He's kidnapped Arthur. There was a really on New Year's Eve when you saw it kind of happening quietly in the background. I had to say <laughs> that was something I thought. Well, wow, that's very good. I'm I'm enjoying this. That's that's yeah. that's nice that they've they've not made it such a dramatic kind of quickly get Arthur out the house. You know, it was just quietly done while all the rest of the slaters <laughs> were right, getting dr- yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the rest of the slaters were getting drunk in the Vic. You know, and they didn't even notice Arthur had missing until the next no, morning. <laughs> if anything, there should be a lesson. <laughs> I know, which, yeah, which shows really does Stacey deserve Arthur? <laughs> really, um, all you have to do is tuck up a pillow, and they think their child is asleep in bed. But yeah. it's fine. And so Kush has gone to a hotel it and. Looks like a nice hotel as well it did and he said that arthur was having a good time but then when later after the phone call he said that to ruby he went up to arthur and arthur was like i'm bored yeah. <laughs> this place sucks i don't want to yeah. be here take him to a butlins you know that would have been At a much least. better solution <laughs> and so ruby is helping and i use that term very loosely trying to find out what's happening with kush and arthur but she's basically just been pushed to one side and said well you know you're not really one of the family this is yeah. a problem for us to sort out go away so again ruby's plan has backfired for it's her just and disintegrated she's, before her very eyes yeah, no it? involvement whatsoever for her it must be heartbreaking that she's just but again it's it's she's laid her own bed here if she'd been a bit more kinder to stacy perhaps she would then be more involved with this it's it's a catch-22 situation i think mm. ruby's found herself in but it's kind of like what exactly was her plan was she like so kush and arthur run away and what was ruby planning on just kind of stepping into the limelight saving the day getting kush back and all of a sudden martin sees her as the most amazing thing on two legs and then stacy is humbled by the fact that she helped her or something is that what she was hoping was going to happen I don't know. I thought that it might be that because he's lost a child, that then yeah. he'd be like, oh, Ruby, I do want a child after all to oh, replace yeah, Arthur. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, that's a convoluted way of sort of getting that together, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Christ. It's, a, it's a funny old one. And this is what I mean, though. Why is Ruby working so hard? She, it's someone who she probably won't end up being with in about six months' time. <laughs> no, because I think that Stacey and Martin are actually really well suited. Um, and I think actually being with Ruby has sort of highlighted that. Which I think is ultimately where Martin... Because obviously, the way it's going, Martin and Stacey are going to be back together probably by the spring. It's it, anything, anything that kind of builds up this rivalry between Stacey and Ruby is fine in my book because I'm really enjoying it. I, yeah, I don't think that Ruby's plans are going to come to fruition that quickly. Keep trying and trying and trying to ruin things and eventually that's going to blow up in her face. Yeah. And Martin's just going to dump her and go back to Stacey anyway. Cat, Stacy, and Martin go to Phil for help, um, asking them if they know where Kush has gone. Phil <laughs> reminds them that he's got a deal with Kush, and if Kush has gone, then he's in more trouble than he knows. Yeah. Then Cat and Stacy and Martin kind of fall back and be like, "Oh no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm sure he's just gone to the ice cream shop to buy some ice cream." <laughs> <laughs> um, um, can we briefly discuss, or what did you think between Phil and Cat? I was about to say, there's a uh, lot of there's a lot of rumor. Way, there's the chemistry between them. Yeah, there's been a lot of history between them i mean I, I find it a bit mad that they're now planning to put them together if they Maybe are in a relationship up. and we are going purely on media speculation as well it, aren't we really if they do put them together i have to be honest with you i don't think it will i don't think it will work i mean they're, they're good as kind of like rivals in the sense that like they've got a really good comic relationship together but i can't i i can't see cat as the next sharon or anything like that. no and not there at is all. no I, I can't see a single way in which Cat would ever sleep with Phil unless it was for her own reasons or to get something out of him or something like that. I can't see her falling madly in love with Phil Mitchell. I'm not particularly that excited about them getting together. I mean, you're right. They are funny together, but I wouldn't go any further than that. It's not something I'm waving a flag for. Phil has got himself involved with other story this week, which basically getting to see Raymond because Lucas has shown his hand to Denise. Uh, Chelsea has pretty much taken Lucas's side as well. And so Denise is getting very on edge, nervy. She doesn't want to leave the house. I, I was shocked that she let Patrick kind of leave the house with Raymond this week. Um, Patrick has made a deal with Phil for Phil to kind of give Lucas a warning. You know, he's made a really bad deal, I think, with Phil because now Phil's got a, a hand on Yeah, Phil's his got son. the upper hand now, hasn't he? Mm. Because essentially all Phil needs to do is say, well, I'll tell Denise and then Patrick's just going to have to do whatever Phil says. So it's not exactly a genius move on Patrick's part, really. 
Um, I did enjoy uh, Phil going into the kebab shop with his little 50p football. Um, <laughs> he is, I, I think that the only thing that Phil's doing at this point is just keep having kids and keep buying footballs until he has a son that he can play football with. I know, he's desperate, isn't he? He's desperate for a lad, isn't he? Yeah, for, for bless him. his child. It's never going to happen. No. Well, this is his third attempt at like... Yeah, uh... at least. <laughs> one gay, one dead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Patrick's playing a real dangerous game here. I mean, he's he's seeing Denise in a really vulnerable state. Mm. Um, she's literally tearing herself apart of, with worry over Lucas coming along and, you know, manipulating her. She's kind of come up with this, with an idea that the only reason Lucas didn't kill her the first time around was because he, she's the only one that he's respected, the only one he's probably loved. And with that in mind, she thinks that he's uh, aimed his crosshairs on her this second time round because he he made the mistake once he won't do it again so out of desperation i think patrick did go to phil for help but i mean phil he knows that there's that link with raymond he is almost like he forgot that link with raymond until phil brought it up when he said i'll help you but i want to have a relationship with my son almost too easily accepted that i don't think he felt like i don't think patrick felt like he had a huge amount of options available to him though really did he i mean the whole idea is that phil scares lucas off now i was a bit confused here because obviously chelsea and lucas were having some meal in a restaurant chelsea went to the loo to sniff coke or something (laughs) so i'm sure that it will be a thing again at some point her and isaac Um, could probably get together yeah or peter Oh yeah, um, yeah, or any number of the young people on the, of square. The on the square. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and then Phil turns up at the restaurant and sort of like, oh, do you remember me? And Lucas is almost like, no, who are you? Sorry. Obviously, I'd forgotten completely that Phil and Lucas used to have quite a big rivalry at one point. So I'm glad that that kind of made reared his head again. But then the next time that we see Chelsea and Lucas together, Lucas gets attacked by a group of thugs. Now I didn't actually make the connection that that was Phil that had arranged that. It was it Phil though. That's what I mean. Was hmm. it Phil, or was that just somebody else that Lucas has managed to annoy? Or, or, or was it Chelsea? And when she went to the toilet, was she making a phone call to the thugs to remind them where they are and when when to set it up? Well, she seemed quite upset in the car. Uh, but yeah, f- come on, <laughs> Sharon was upset when Ian got whacked round the head. Yeah, but she not was... that upset. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but Sharon acts with her eyes. She she was upset. Well, you could tell. Acts she, with her mouth. She <laughs> acts with her screaming. Yeah, which again isn't out of character. I'll be honest with no. you for Chelsea. Is it another? The revenge plot that's bubbling uh, along in the background possibly i didn't think of that whatsoever but it's possible i suppose i just think that it's i mean I, i'm still completely none the wiser how it makes any sense for lucas to be out this out of prison with no police escorts whatsoever considering he used to be a serial killer and mm. still is a serial killer i'm guessing that i'm just gonna have to forget about that and just go with the flow of the story <laughs> um Mm, I mean, again, going to the quotes of John Send, the interview, the interview <laughs> this the week. Interview, the big in- the Frost versus Nixon type interview that John Send gave. <laughs> Almost parallel. Denise feels portrayed by Chelsea. And so I don't know if this is kind of building up to the, you know, there's this tension between her her daughter and, and Denise and that actually Chelsea is doing everything in her power to actually help Denise. I mean, Phil, for me, it felt like that Phil's warning to him when he went to the restaurant was what Phil felt like he had done enough. Yeah. Because after uh, after he'd, he'd done it, he went straight to Patrick and said, I've done my part. Now you fulfill yours. Yeah. And, and I, then you saw the beatings. I don't know. I like, don't think it has anything to do with Phil. I wonder if it's got anything to do with Phil too. I really don't. And I wonder if that will be then Patrick's out by saying like, oh, you said you were going to sort Lucas out. And actually it was someone else completely different <laughs> who actually yeah. warned Lucas away. Because I almost feel as well that when Phil wants someone being beaten up or have their legs broken or killed, yes, if, if he was going to get killed, then he tends to get someone else to throw them into the back of a van and remove their teeth. But things like beating them up, he's more likely to send Ben or or someone we know to do it rather than just this random group of youngsters mm. essentially i don't think it was phil i don't think it had anything to do with phil i think that's a mystery for possibly next week lovely jack i mean you can't but love jack he came along I think you're fine if you refer to my tier list I can <laughs> <love> jack. <laughs> he came along saw denise she hasn't washed since christmas day <laughs> and no. he's like go upstairs have a shower you, you stinky cow, stinky bitch <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. and um and so she did but again i love the way that denise melts when jack's around <laughs> do not though i love the relationship between jack and denise it's such a surprise their relationship oh, no. and how much i'm enjoying it between them it's all right i just 
I, I don't, your I cold, don't, cold heart. A bitter. We know this. Um, I don't know. It's I don't. That's something about them just doesn't excite me all that much as a couple. I, I get that they fancy each other, but uh, I, I, I get that they're going to get to get back together. You know, I don't hate them as a couple, but I'm not like I've seen a lot of support from Denise and Jack as a couple online, and it's like uh, okay, I don't I don't get like that level of love towards them whatsoever. I don't know what they've done to deserve that level of love as a couple. They just mm. work when they're on screen together. Right. Both both the actors work well together oh, they yeah, play no, off they, each other really do. well and no, i do, no, and i do. and i see a genuine warmth between them whenever denise is when uh, denise and jack are in each other's company there's a genuine connection there and i i, I did, like like i say in this, this week's episode when jack came along no one nothing anyone was saying not kim not patrick not no one was helping Probably denise out really. of her out of her quandary, out of her problem. The only one yeah. who did was Jack, and that was by him basically saying, "Go and have a wash, you stink." <laughs> and and it was just and it, like that honesty between them. Like they've they've not known they've not had a relationship that long, but they seem to open up and be honest with each other. And I it think feels it like worked. they've been together for years. Yeah, it does though. Their relationship from beginning to this point feels complete enough that they can continue. How did they get it. together? How did they get together? Yeah. Do you know what I can't? <laughs> No, well, I don't hate them. I'm just not excited by them. But it's fine. They're together, and I'm, you know, I watch them. And if, it, to be fair, anything that kind of gives Jack anything to sort of jumpstart his personality, I'm happy to see. So that's fine. Fair enough. We're going to quickly, 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 quickly talk about uh, Sharon and Ian and Sharon's continued poisoning of Ian. <laughs> Kathy's the only one who seems to see it. Sharon wanted <sighs> Ian gone quickly, and the only one who seems to kind of know it's happening but not doing anything about it when really I feel like he should step in is Phil. Yet again, Phil is getting involved in yet another story. Mm-hmm. But do you not think Phil should step in here and say Sharon... Does I... he know what's going on? He does. He know... Well, he, he said to Sharon that I'm not going to do have anything to do with it because he is, at the end of the day, my son's brother. And so if you want to get have a way with him, it's up to you. But he seems... Every time Phil sees Sharon he kind of gives her her a very disapproving look and I feel like Phil will be will be the one who steps in eventually and says no Sharon what you're doing is wrong I think yeah I think that's I think that's a reasonable thing I just think that it's <laughs> it's so silly how much longer is this going to go on for before Ian works out what Sharon is actually doing because what is she actually doing she's putting she's like, poisoning she's, she's his continuing food to po- yeah she's continuing to poison him with some this some nameless white powder or something and it's like how long can that realistically go on for because does she not think that there'll be some sort of toxicology report made on ian's body that would then decipher what was in his body what has been in his food and how long it's been in there for like she's not very good at this really, oh no is she, this Sharon? is this is exactly it they're gonna she's gonna be found out so th- i don't really know it's really confusing me because again it's they've kind of played character roulette with um Sharon again and they just kind of spun the wheel and decided right this is what she's doing this year and it doesn't it feels it doesn't feel in character for Sharon to do something like that Sharon will Sharon will hate you for the rest of your life will <laughs> be spiteful and not talk to you and I get that she's trying to keep hold of the pub and she oh, she thinks that it's almost a it's her given right to have the Vic yeah from Ian because of what Ian had done. I think she could have done that without needing to kill him. I think she could have done that just by belittling him, being horrible to him and have him kicked out the square. I I think, yeah, I think this killing thing is, um, it needs to kind of deal with itself now because it's, again, like, where, where is the next step? Obviously, she is not going to kill off Ian. Uh, where does it go from here? I mean, we know Adam Woodyat is having a break soon. Or what? What does he run away? Does he promise to leave Sharon the Vic? Does he, you know, go into a six-month coma? What? What? So I, I'd kind of like to see where this goes next and i'd like to see it kind of happen quite quickly as well but but again ian looks like he's on death's door already how much mm. more poisoning does she really need to do and i mean he's going to pass out at some point and then they're going to go to the hospital and ash will stand there with her clipboard yeah and uh, <laughs> and, t- and and it'll all it'll all kind of blow up in sharon's face or something uh, but this is what this is what nasty nick did to dot this is what i mean yeah, are yeah. we now comparing sharon to nasty well no nick? my thinking is because it's the anniversary fairly soon ish isn't it like mm. there'll be like next month so i would imagine that around the time of the a year's anniversary of denny's death that'll be when it come that'll be when ian discovers what sharon is doing would be my guess it, there's more to come but yeah silly <laughs> <laughs> Right, so we're going to take a bit of a break because uh, Rob's now going to humiliate me uh, in Mm. front of all you listeners Mm. and play a little game. Rob, what are we playing? This is Honey or Suki. (laughs) 
So, we are going to the Walford Archives office. It's a little building that's in the middle of Walford that we right. haven't actually seen on screen yet, but it is there. It does exist, I promise you. Is it near the um, public conveniences? Yes, it absolutely I is, it because might be. you need it when you're there for hours, sorting <laughs> through all Walford's archives. Okay. So this week, we're going to play Honey or Suki. Now, the Walford Archives office, but all it really is, it's a huge office made up of statements about Walford and about its people, and about its residents, and about its stories over the past 30, nearly 36 years. Normally, pure as a driven snow, Honey runs this office, <laughs> and we know Honey doesn't lie, she's very honest, very sweet, but Suki has broken into the office, and has <sighs> written some statements herself, and thrown them into the archives with wild abandon. Now, Alex, it is your job to decipher whether the statement I read to you was written by Honey or whether it was written by Suki. Essentially, the originality ends there. This is essentially true or false. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was about to say, yeah, that could have been summed I up. I thought with... I'd give it a bit of character, but essentially this is true or false. Okay. Okay, okay cool, cool, cool. <laughs> so I have eight statements here for you. Mm -hmm. If you think that the statement is true, then you will say it is Honey. If you think the statement is false, then you will say it is Suki. Okay, number one. EastEnders was almost called Square Dance. Suki. No, I don't think that's true. I know it had other that's... names, but I don't think Square Dance was one of them. I can reveal Honey wrote that statement. Really? It was a, yes, it was a genuine working title for the show. Other possible titles included Round the Square, yeah. E8, and London Pride. The last two I knew, I didn't know London Square either. No, l round the Square. Round the Square, sorry, no. Yeah, there you go. Square Dance was originally Square a working Dance. title for Can you imagine? Square Dance. Like, you could just imagine the characters sort of doing some little square dance of a duff duff or something mm. like that. It would be very odd. I've got an interesting um, uh, statement about the EastEnders name. Go on. Oh. Go on. Um, <laughs> EastEnders was originally written with a lowercase e in the middle until, ah. it, as a typo, it had been sent um, to Julia and she oh. said, I like that. And they kept it in. Oh, I like that. I like that as a fact. There you go. That's an... good. And now it's difficult to. It took me a while to sort of naturally type the middle capital E in whenever I was typing the word EastEnders. <laughs> but I do now, naturally. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, statement number two Ian has had seven marriages. Mm, okay, hang on. Uh, let's have a listen. Let's have a think. So there is Mel, Jane twice, Sharon, uh, Cindy, that's five. What's her face? I always forget the her, her the her Bobby face? Bobby's Bobby's mum. I always yes. forget. Her. That's six. Uh -huh. Has he had a seventh that I don't know about? Or that is really blatantly obvious and I should know about. I'm gonna say Suki because I can you're only think of six. Oh, you, I can tell by your tone that I'm wrong. You're like, oh, you're gonna say Suki. Well, that shows how well you know my <laughs> tone, doesn't it, Alex? Because actually, you're absolutely correct. Yay. Suki did write that statement. He has only had six, and that would be Cindy, Mel, Laura, Laura Ferguson, uh, married twice to Jane, and then of course his most recent and far truest <laughs> marriage to <laughs> Sharon. Oh. Next statement number three. There have been three children born in the Vic. Okay, Pearl was born in the Vic. Mm -hmm. <sighs> three, <laughs> three kids. I'm trying to think. Mm. Three born in the Vic. I'm going to say true, but I can't think of the other two. Are going to say what? Sorry, honey, honey. I'm going to say honey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is correct. Well oh. done. Uh, uh, the three kids that were born in the Vic, as you say, were Pearl Fox Hubbard. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Moon was born in the Vic. And the first one that was ever born in the Vic was Liam Butcher. <laughs> was he? There now? you go. Okay, fair enough. Uh, statement number four. In 1986, Den handed Angie her divorce papers on Christmas Day when he discovered that she had been lying about having months to live. That's without debate. I'm not asking you to debate that sentence. No. However, true. <laughs> yes. It's what, sorry? True. Uh, uh, no. Honey. No, thank you. Uh, he, uh, the question is, he discovered this on the QE2. That's Suki, and it was mm -hmm. on the Orient Express when they went Correct. to Italy. Yes, Angie poured her heart out to a barman, unaware yeah. that Den was standing right behind her. Yeah, that's good, that scene. Really good. No, well, well done. Uh, number five, the biggest car you can fit in the Archers with the doors closed in real life is a Ford Escort. That's Suki, because I believe it's a smaller than that. I think it's a mini. I don't it think it's a mini. Yeah, I don't well think. Done correct. Yes. Well done. Thank you. Oh, I thought that would get you. I'm quite annoyed about that one. Uh, <laughs> right, so. <laughs> if I saw that fact, and I was like, oh, that's a good one. I like that. Uh, the first character <laughs> to receive a duff duff was Den Watts. 
Right, there's a bit of a contention with this because mm-hmm. the, this obviously this is linking to the first ep- episode, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and what happens is is that Nick has a fight with Ali, mm-hmm. and then Nick and Ali get thrown out, and then the duff duff is when he when Nick puts his fist through the mm-hmm. door. So there's a there's a thi- there's an argument that actually Nick got the first duff duff. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say that's Suki and false. Well, I'm going to give you half a point okay. because it is Suki. However, the bone of contention arises in that first episode because the credits come up as the Duff Duff plays ah, in right. that first episode. So that's technically nobody gets a Duff Duff in the first episode. The credits get the Duff Duff. The credits get the Duff Duff, <laughs> essentially. So do you know, to regain your other half point, who actually received the first Duff Duff in EastEnders? Which oh. character received the proper Duff Duff oh. in episode two? god um just gonna throw a guess out there and Mm -hmm. i'm gonna say pauline fowler it was dr leg oh i'm glad about that that's nice isn't it yeah so he he um was being interviewed by the police for the about the murder of reg cox and it was the duff duff was him discovering that it was a murder inquiry dr leg was stunned and shocked i would be too yes poor old leg Exactly. So yeah, Dr. Leg received the first ever character Duff Duff in EastEnders. But, uh, <laughs> um, for the credits got the first Duff Duff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The writer of the episode got the first <laughs> Duff Duff. Um, statement number seven, Ben Mitchell has been played by six actors. Oh, blimey Um, Right. Uh, <laughs> again, it's going to be thingy and him because I can't remember the actors' names. I've, I reckon there was two baby Ben, two young Bens, the okay. baby Ben and then mm-hmm. a kind of toddler Ben. Mm-hmm. Then there's the Ben who likes Girls Aloud. Yep. Then there's the Ben who killed Heather. Mm-hmm. Then there's the Ben who married Paul. Mm-hmm. And then there's the current Ben. Okay. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, honey, there is six. Correct. Yes. Well done. The actors, uh, first ever actor, uh, Matthew Silver, and then followed by Morgan Whittle. Mm. Then uh, Girls Aloud, Ben was Charlie Jones, followed by Heather Killing, Joshua Pascoe, Paul Loving, Harry Reid, and Police uh, Loving, <laughs> Max Bowden. <laughs> well done. And then finally, final statement in Honey or Suki, Sharon was originally to be called Tracy. <gasps> I think that's true. Uh, da 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 da. I'm going to say honey. Honey, true. Correct. Yes. Well done. Dan would have been called Jack. Get this. And Angie would have been called Pearl. There you go. And Sharon would, would have been called Tracy. Anita Dobson wasn't the original choice either for no. Angie. Some woman got her up absolutely broken. <laughs> well, she was on there and they filmed, they started filming the scenes with yeah. her and she was not meant to be very good. So they quickly got Anita in. Uh, well, she, well, I don't think she was, like, she was very good. I think she was just wrong for the part. I think Julia Smith decided that she just wasn't Angie. In that moment, yeah, so, yeah, and then so not very good. Came along and history was made. <laughs> yes, well, it was a good choice made as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, well done. How many did you get right? Six you and a half. A, a six and a half. Are you, are you counting? Were you? That's <laughs> yes, nice. <I> was. <laughs> well, well done. I suppose. Yeah. So that was that game. That was Honey or Suki. Right. So we're now talking about Grey and Tina, and Tina has found the truth out about Grey. Grey's not taking it very well. And no, to say the least. Seemingly, we have now said our final goodbyes to Tina because <sighs> she was on the ground with bruises around her neck, strangulation. And by... wrapped up like a Subway sandwich. Well, wrapped up like a present, I thought, <laughs> which I thought was quite fitting <laughs> considering it was Christmas. <laughs> I was just waiting. I thought it was one bow away of sticking that on her head uh, and then that was it. Like... Just one tacky little label on there was all that was needed. <laughs> yeah. Um, How do you feel about this basically being the continuation of Chantel's I'm not, I'm domestic not, abuse storyline. <laughs> not entirely impressed, to be honest. No, um, I don't think it's right. I don't think that it's the story. What, what if if I'm, now for a start, I would say that I don't actually believe that Tina's dead because I think that how many exits have we had in the past year? How many of them have had like big old montages put on Facebook and the team saying goodbye and all of this kind of thing? I think that they're kind of leading us into a bit of a fake out and Tina's going to be revealed to be tied up in a cellar somewhere. I hope so anyway, because I if she is killed off like this and murdered by Grey, because we didn't see where the, where she was put or anything like that and we haven't heard hide nor hair of this story since she apparently was killed. But if she was murdered, that is such a horrible way for the characters to go because not only did she survive her own domestically violent relationship she was Mm. then killed by somebody else who was domestically violent what kind of story are they trying to tell in that regard 
I know. It, it, it's, it feels very strange that they're doing a, almost a serial killer story now with Grey. It doesn't feel right for... It doesn't... It feels, it feels like it just cheapens what was originally quite a powerful story. Mm. And now it's just been flung into the world of melodrama. It doesn't feel right. No. I, I found it strange that they were hinting a lot that gray was going to be found out throughout as well like it was mm. it, it, it's i know it's a really weird thing to spot but like that the fact that you saw that the little bit of the sheet that he wrapped tina in was hanging out the back of the boot i know it's probably to give a little bit of like suspense that all the police are going to see that and wonder what it was but i thought it was a really odd thing for them to kind of point out and what warehouse have they used this time round? Yeah, essentially, <laughs> and to put Tina into. What I love is the fact that last week we said like how how strange it was not to have over Christmas period anyone tied up, anyone flung in the back of the car. Literally, <laughs> the next episode, all of that happened. <laughs> I know, I know. I do. I just, I, I like you. I felt like it just ruined a story that they had done all right with apart from the Mm. aftermath wasn't that great yeah Yeah, i just i think i think we haven't seen the back of tina just yet i mean we've had so many fake outs like di gaffney for argument's sake you know (laughs) he was he was he romanticized this week about how he was put in a coffin left for dead and then he came back to life and just almost nonchalantly went back to the police station to start his job again you know yeah although i if they decide to give us a fake out and it's Gaffney that gets the fake out and Tina doesn't that's outrageous as well (laughs) very strange Greg kind of lucked out a little bit too because everyone now thinks that Tina's run away and he's not he's not denying that Um, Shirley found her necklace on the floor and kind of just I don't know whether she was joking or not but sarcastically said that was a waste of (laughs) $14.99 yeah wasn't that expensive was it I I know the death of her her, um, you know her sister is now Um, it, yeah that's that's what it's worth it's it's yeah i don't well i suppose that kind of sums up the story doesn't it that's mm. it's cheapened it that it's her the whole chantelle's domestic abuse story can be round up as being worth 14.99 as yeah, a necklace exactly. on the floor it's it's annoying and i really hope that it, there's a fake out where tina doesn't just turns out to not be dead and tina is ultimately you know she doesn't i I get the actress has left but she kind of she could have she can just kind of come back for about two episodes or something to tie it all up and get gray sent to prison and then go off on her merry way somewhere else yeah you know it doesn't i i will be really really annoyed if tina has actually died because i think that's a horrible way for that character that particular character to finish i wouldn't say that tina has been the most exciting character in terms of stories that she's ever had throughout her time on the square but the one thing that we have had established about her quite heavily is the fact that she was the victim of domestic abuse and she escaped that domestic abuse and was able to sort of live her life quite happily after that so for her then to be killed off by somebody who was domestically violent feels really wrong mick also had quite a big week this week as some might say because it it was the i want to say the end but it's not the end but it kind of it's it's been rounded off quite nicely Mm. for it to then kind of plod along i suppose yeah lack of a better term that mick has finally finally discovered or, or come to terms that he was abused when he was a child by katie he's had it out with katie but oh, this it was, this it was it was a wonderful scene on new year's day but oh, new year's eve amazing okay so we've got the most it basically was technically a one-hander with mick on the phone fo- well there's a two-hander with mick on the phone to uh joe from samaritan yeah this disjointed um, voice which I thought, no, that was all right i didn't have an issue uh... with the voice at all i thought he did really well the character of joe kind of gave the impression that the Samaritans are, are worth talking to. One thing to come out of this, if anything, is that the fact that Samaritans is uh, is an amazing, amazing yeah. group and charity. Because and actually, I would imagine New Year's Eve is a, is a very busy day for them. Uh, a little bit of me wanted to see Joe at the Why? call centre because, I don't know, I, I wanted him... To, this was obviously seemed to be a very important call. This is like yeah. all calls. Okay. Oh God, I'm digging holes. Wow. All calls to the Samaritans are very important. This, but I would like to see how Joe was reacting to what he was being told on the phone. So I would have liked to seen Joe okay, mean? at the, at the call center, kind of his response to it. No, I get what you mean. And because it was this disjointed voice, I didn't quite, I didn't quite get on bored with it as much right. as i think the writers had intended for me to okay but I you, but, but i sorry 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 but i would say that i think danny dyer's performance was amazing and to add strength to my, then my point if you saw joe and the performance was just as good being played on screen for me i think then that that would have been a perfect two-hander essentially between them 
Um, I get what you mean. However, what I would argue is anybody that's ever called the Samaritans and has been talked down from the brink like Mick was, this person will always be a faceless figure. You know, it's it's anybody who's ever been in Mick's situation at that point and has recalled the Samaritans and has effectively... Because I'm assuming the Samaritans have conversations like that every single day where someone is talked down from the brink of suicide and they will always just be this faceless sort of angel that helped them at that moment and then that conversa- and then they'll never have a conversation again because mm. you can't guarantee that you talk to the same person the next time you're in the Samaritans. It, I think for me it was it was very much from Mick's perspective. You know, at the end of the day, Joe was someone who works for the Samaritans and his job is to deal with that. So at the end of the day, Joe was very good at his job, but that effectively was his job or volunteer, I'm not sure whether you actually work for the Samaritans or not. That's just what Joe's role was in that position. And he would have put the phone down to Mick and then maybe had exactly the same conversation with somebody else. That's the role of the Samaritans. I don't think we needed to see Joe. It wasn't like when Lee was doing it and we had that brilliant scene with the um, the car park attendant where she was given a full-on character and we've got to learn her story and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. I think that what the whole idea of it was was that we there was talking about the Samaritans as an organisation and realizing what can be done with the Samaritans on the phone and what service they actually give. And I think that the whole idea of ringing the Samaritans, some people would feel that they would rather it just be a voice and talking to them that they have no emotional connection to that wouldn't recognize them in the street, wouldn't, um, do you know what I mean? Like I feel. I do, was... I do, I, and I, I see what you're saying about it being this kind of like this faceless person who mm. basically, because there is no relationship between them, which essentially was the reason why Mick couldn't talk to Linda, couldn't talk to Lee. It was nice to see Lee back this week as well. Oh, nice surprise to see yeah. Lee. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Apart from the actor ruined it by posting two hours beforehand, like watch out EastEnders tonight. I might be oh, on did it. I didn't, oh, I didn't yeah. see that. <laughs> which was just like, oh god, why that. that that would have been a really nice surprise if you hadn't done that. But it's fine. Yeah. And I see what you're saying. Because Mick couldn't talk to people who were close to him, he was found it easier to talk to the person who wasn't close to him. But I don't think you would have lost that if you saw Joe. Mm, I do. A... That's the thing. Okay. I kind of, okay. I'm gonna, my only thing of it is like, like you say, if you if you're putting yourself in Mick's shoes, um, and like we say, he couldn't talk to anybody that he knew about it. So the whole point was that he talks to somebody that he's never met before and he will never meet again. That I think is a lot of ways of why the Samaritans work so well as an organisation. Because you never meet this person unless you choose to actually, you know, find them to do, you know, thank them or whatever. You know, you're never going to meet them and you're never probably going to speak to them ever again. And for for some, that's a vital sort of component to Mm. the thing. Now, I get that, you know, from a dramatic point of view, you probably wanted to see Joe on the other end of the phone. I get that. But I, I think that the message that they were trying to get across in that regard worked. My problem with the New Year's Eve episode, if I had to have one, was the fact that they did all these flashbacks with um, sort of young Mick and young Katie and all that sort of thing. Now, this isn't me complaining about the whole thing of flashbacks as a whole, but what I would argue is that the flashbacks used didn't particularly add anything. No, Because I felt that the dialogue, which you'd expect from a Simon Ashdown script who wrote it, uh, was so vivid and rich, and the performances by Danny Dyer in particular were that kind of gripping all the kind of questions that we might have had at that moment were being filled in quite easily anyway so mm. i don't think we needed to see kind of little boy mick running around the care home and all of that sort of thing no but i get what they were trying to do with it it just didn't add anything for me style choices for the sake of adding it and mm. um yeah you're right they should be able to have written that in which is discuss his time in the care home and like yeah. they, they had that really quick passing scene with him and stewart and it's like what if they gave like stewart and mick an episode where he could have talked about these things to stewart a little bit. Yeah, but they seem of... to establish in that little scene that Stuart didn't really have that much to do with Mick in the care home. Mm, he had enough to know about yeah, Katie no, would, and their would, relationship. Yeah, he knew Katie, but I feel that like the way that they did it would imply that Stuart kind of kind of popped in and in and out of Mick's life at that point. Mm. And the whole Katie thing wasn't really on Stuart's peripheral, which I... is a shame because it would have been a really nice way to sort of connect the characters again. In a funny way, I think that has connected them a little bit, or I think the writing feels like that they've they've done that now. Yeah. <laughs> um but, you know, I'm just saying that I don't think that the use of flashbacks, as as you said, worked or, or could have been done differently, which is I why... Felt, yeah, I felt that the flashbacks could have given us more if that, if that was what well, we were going to have. Yeah. But I don't or, think that or, they did. Or not use them at all. I don't think they could, they, could yeah. they... could they not have found a way of writing it into the story without having the flashbacks, you know, prior to, the, to that episode on New Year's Eve, which is why I felt like I was going in watching this episode of him on the phone to Samaritans and he's saying like this, that and the other. And obviously, as you say, those flashbacks were meant to be 
filling in the gaps for us, but it didn't fill in the gaps for me. I, I, I wish that I knew. I wish going into the episode on New Year's Eve, I knew that anyway, yeah. without having them then to mm. add these but, stylistic. Yeah, scenes I mean, and the thing there. is, I didn't feel that the gaps that those flashbacks were trying to fill in. I actually had any gaps on. I don't think there was has ever been any doubt at any point during this story for us that mm. Mick was kind of wrong about what he was thinking or that there was any sort of questionable thing about whether Katie actually did do this. I think that it's been fairly well established that what Mick is feeling right now is completely what happened and Katie has just been manipulating yeah. him and trying to make him think that he's going mad or trying to think that he is uh, not answering, uh, that he's, um, all these questions that he's got are, are completely out of his imagination all of that sort of thing. But the fact that they're using the flashbacks is obviously that they wanted us to fill in these gaps. This is what I mean. Do you see, I, I, yeah. I don't, maybe I'm not putting myself across right here, but... but they obviously wanted us to know this extra information. So when the episode ended, I felt like that that extra information that they've given me would fell a bit flat. I, I yeah. you know, I went into the episode probably like you thinking, right, I know the setup for this, so I know mm. what's to come. But by adding those extra scenes at the end of the episode, I felt like that I was missing something now and that they, they almost the opposite of what they had planned for those flashbacks to do it. For me, it fell the other way around. It felt like that I was now I was lacking the information that I should have known before the episode. It, yeah. it's, it's weird. I don't know. But they made up for it because <laughs> yeah, no. on New Year's Day. New it, Year's Day, I'm going to go on record and say it was an absolutely phenomenal episode. I mean, it's a stonker. For the very yeah. first episode of 2021, I mean, this it is this is how EastEnders should... Episode. Oh, yes. it felt perfect, didn't it? Now, that is... I, I would argue that that is very much because they... Um, did some stuff with social distancing that allowed them, you know, bubbled them or did regular tests or whatever that allowed the characters of Mick and Linda and Mick and Casey to be within contact with each other and actually touch each other and all of that kind of thing. And it felt like it was just... Th th those scenes, especially with Mick and Katie, were absolutely electric. Dialogue was incredible. I'm going to throw a shout out to this um, writer, apparently. Was only, was, that was his third episode, by the way. Uh, okay. Kevin Rundle, his third episode of EastEnders, stunning stuff. And I mean, that scene where Mick, you know, is leaving the house and says, No, I'm going to go tell Linda. And, you know, they're actually fighting with each other and scrapping with each other. And Mick Kate is trying to drag him back into the house. And then she slams the door behind him and lets out this sort of feral scream because she knows that it's all going to start falling apart soon. Yeah. It was incredible. And then Mick goes home and him and Linda have a really, really nice conversation as well i loved um, the scene with mick and linda um and I, and I want to i want to put a pin in that just for a second because i want to go yeah. back to the katie and mick scenes yeah. um do you think it would have made the uh, the scene was fantastic the writing the way it was acted i uh, do you think adding frankie to it even if just like at the end maybe she kind of sees do you think that would have added more to it or do you think that um, it, was, it was unnecessary to add more i don't think she was needed at that moment there will be mm -hmm. scenes with frankie later because mick apparently the thing is i'm still somewhat in doubt about whether frankie is his son is his daughter or not katie that, katie said that she was yeah i know but i almost feel as though that was katie sort of scrambling for the easiest way out i mean i could be completely wrong and that could have just been a complete confirmation that frankie's his mixed daughter and fine because i just don't feel that mick would have been the first person that katie would have done this to i i must say that was something that came into my mind that if katie but then i think katie loved mick and and she she was constantly saying to Mick on the episode that you know you loved me you were infatuated with me you were sending me love letters it was all about you <sighs> loving me yeah. but I think inside the Katie felt the same way toward him and I I mean maybe she had abused other young lads or girls yeah. in the past but I think Mick was always. What? her one I know which yeah, is a horrible yeah. term to use but no, you know, know what I mean, mean. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that was always her one. When Mick discovered those letters he sent to her mm. in the room, oh, that she's kept, that she's all kept, these years. exactly, and she's kept the shirts that he was that we've been hearing so much about as well. Like this woman is just, there's no words for her. Like she is just absolute scum, and I mean, so incredibly acted because she's chilling. Some of the things that she was saying to him, you know, saying that. And you could see what she was doing. She was trying to make him think that, you know, you were a 12-year-old boy, you lost your virginity to an old woman. Most proper men would love that. You know, you're mm. pathetic and all of that. It was just 
skin crawlingly good. Yeah, I don't think that Frankie was necessarily needed because I think that though that scene between her and Mick was needed to be just the two of them. And I'm so pleased that they did the stuff with the social distancing that allowed it to just look like a proper EastEnders scene without them having to do weird camera tricks to make it look as though they were close when they weren't and all that kind of thing. It was allowed to just be a raw EastEnders yeah. confrontation scene. It was perfect. Yeah. Let, let's talk about Mick and Linda's scene yes. then afterwards. So, but Linda... And Max were going to go off and see Lauren in New Zealand. <laughs> oh, to the shell um, of her house. To the, yeah, to the her shell. Linda turned him down. Max basically drank his woes away in the Vic. That's all I'm we need so to say about that. I'm <laughs> so pleased that this went the way it did. Because at the start of New Year's Day, I wanted to punch Max. Oh, He was just yeah. like, we opened the door. It was like, nah, she's, yeah, she's not here. What do you need to see her for? And then just kind of closed the door in Mick's face. It was yeah. like, oh, you little word. Prat. He's, he's a prat. He's a, he's Such a... a maggot oh yeah um, big time and, and and also the fact that he had the tickets to go to new zealand he obviously phoned lauren to say oh we're go- i'm gonna come visit you yeah. and then just thought well no if linda's not going i don't want to see my I daughter don't go, I don't, yeah i'm not about <laughs> seeing any of the rest of my family that's yeah. left the, in this, my life this man who beat up jack on the boat during boat week because jack hadn't mentioned that she phoned him once yeah. and, and you know he's, he's the, the undenying loving father of lauren and yet doesn't <laughs> well killed his other daughter and doesn't yeah. give a damn about lauren at all he's just he's <laughs> such a word He's a horrible, horrible character. I'm glad he is leaving. Nothing to do with Jake Wood, because Jake Wood plays it brilliantly. And I don't think it's even out of character for Max at this stage. Oh, it? No. it feels perfectly true to Max's character. Mm. Um, but yeah, very little sympathy for Max. So Linda goes back, though, sees the pink dressing gown, breaks down. It's, that was nice. That oh, was a nice character moment. Fantastic moment. Again, lovely. And Mick. I mean, Mick, he... He is a saint, isn't he? Really, let's think about it. Because in a lot of ways, yeah. He's he's gone through this this whole process. He's finally, you know, kind of accepted it. Had it out with Katie. Said, you know, that's the end of it. Goes back to Linda, and the first thing he does is forgive Linda for sleeping with Max. I think it was, yeah, I know. I mean, I think that it's was very beautiful. Much a, it was a great it moment, is. and I think it was very much a react, a sort of knee jerk reaction to how anxious and how kind of unsure he was feeling at that point. Because about two minutes beforehand, when he sat alone in the flat, he thinks that. Linda's on his on her way to New Zealand and he's effectively lost everything. And then Linda sort of comes back and I think if anything, all of that sort of forgiveness was more relief. And I think maybe as we go forward and sort of the dust starts to settle on what happened to him that day. It, that sort of resentment might build itself up again. But it you know what weirdly it kind of felt that I forgave Linda for doing that as well by the time the scene was finished. Like this was Mick and Linda again. It felt like yeah. a reset button had been pressed. How bad and- is that? We've when we've been saying like the past mm. month or so mm. that the pair of them feel like they've, they've come the to end. an end of the line and, oh I agree and yet one great episode between the two of them yeah. shows the strength of them as characters and we're and we're on board with them as a couple again yeah. and long live Mick and Linda it was, that, it was just that one moment for me where Mick went over to Linda and again the social distancing because they made their own bubble they were able to yeah, do this uh, kind yeah, of filming and Mick went over and just took Linda's hand and then rested his head on her head. And they just had that intimate moment. No words were said. And they just kind of both weeped a little bit together that they've mm. just gone through this. They've had a hell of a couple of years. And it's yeah. almost like they've just kind of together just said, oh, that's it. Maybe maybe that's it. Now, now maybe we can start having a happy life with Ollie and start rebuilding this relationship again. And it just, it was just a wonderful moment. And like I say, it was just, it was old EastEnders again and it felt, yeah. it just felt right. I mean, we can't have this every day. I admit, you know, no. we're never going to get EastEnders episode every day going to be just pow, pow, pow like that, especially where the filming has to be very much a lot stricter. But to have that one injection episode where, and especially being the first episode of 2021 as well, almost to say that like, this is the set piece. This is where we're heading now. This is yeah. what we're going to do this year. It felt, it felt right again. And it yeah. was, it was I... a good moment. And I would like to, you know, I and I would say massive applause to, you know, everyone behind the scenes as well. You know, we, yes, we have had our criticisms of things like stories and all of that kind of thing and the way that the direction that some characters have been taken and all that sort of thing. But at no point, I don't think, have we ever debated the ridiculously hard work that is clearly going on behind the cameras to make the show look the way it does at the moment. With all these restrictions in place and everything that's going on. You know, no other soap has been uh, been putting actors in bubbles so that they can film intense scenes like that. No other show has bothered doing that. Although apparently Corey did. But I was about to say Corey look, did it. Didn't it. Look like, it didn't look like they had. No, it was awful. <laughs> no, it was. It was. It was. It was complete. You know, it was. What we saw from EastEnders New Year's Day was the result of what that can do. Then Corey should be hanging its head in shame mm. because 
that's st the stuff that we were seeing on New Year's Day was phenomenal. It looked incredible. And and again, you know, even when the if you think about the New Year's Eve episode when Mick's wandering through the pub to get to the roof, the pub was full of like party revelers. I mean, yeah, admittedly, not a single pub was doing that in the land on New Year's <laughs> Eve, unfortunately. But at the same time, it looked like, like a pub was full of people. Mm. And it probably was full of people. But, at the, you know, they didn't need to do that. Mick could have gone in from the side entrance and just come through the cellar and then gone straight upstairs again. Mm. They didn't need to show mm. them going through the pub. But they did because they have been trying to make EastEnders look as normal as possible. Yeah. And fully applause to that, I say. And it, it, the effort shows and it pays, and it pays dividends. I'm glad they didn't split up EastEnders, though, because that would have been... An, again, the episode worked because it flowed. It was one yeah, and, episode. And it was the longest episode we've had of EastEnders. It was an hour. It was a full it was hour. A full hour. Even yeah. Christmas Day wasn't a full hour. No. I know. I, again, I was I, I was blown away. I was like, an yeah. hour? It's an actual full Just hour. everything about it. It felt like a proper old-school classic yeah. EastEnders episode that was on for the full 60 minutes, that had people actually touching each other. It just felt like <laughs> I was back in 2019. I know. It was like being in a time machine. Anyway, yeah. I, I, I think we've we've spoken enough uh, do you mind if we move on to Callum and Stuart if we must <laughs> <laughs> uh, really briefly then let's talk about how Stuart has been not arrested he got taken to the police station to have a word <laughs> with <laughs> with um the ghost of D.I. Gaffney because he has returned um Yay. and uh yeah without with, with nothing like not even a bruise Brilliant. or anything on him he just Brilliant. like <laughs> Kind of turns up. Just turns back. It. it went to his review. Yeah, everything presumably fine because yeah. Gaffney's back in charge of Warford Police or whatever. <laughs> and yeah, and then just walks in, and Stuart's kind of like, ah, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about that. <laughs> but but the the whole obviously Di Gaffney now has something on Stuart, which is Halfway's brother. So he's obviously going to use that as leverage now against Callum for maybe I don't know, go undercover again. And Callum's gone running to Jack after he had that moment with Ben, where Ben said, oh, "I'll do anything for you. You're my love. I love you. I'll get uh, I'll get I'll the get Richie, uh, Richie on the vault, yeah, on on the books, on and the get vault. her to look. At <laughs> I'll get Richie on the books and get her to have a look at it for you on the case. And and yeah. I love the Callum kind of sat there like, "You do that for me." And it's like, oh, for goodness sake, how long have you been together for? You're you're in a relationship. Of course, Ben will. Oh, just maddening, maddening that Callum and Ben still are like on what feels like the first month of their relationship. And they've been together, what, over a year now? Uh, too long. Uh, it's so long. <laughs> but <laughs> Callum goes running to Jack and says, I'm in trouble. I'm stitch up Phil I've stitched up the police of all the people to go to <laughs> I know goes to Jack. I've stitched up everyone else and now I need your help and what does he think Jack's gonna do well I don't know I really don't know what but could Jack possibly do to go anywhere to fixing this enormous pile of mess that Callum has created for himself <laughs> deeming pile of manure that Callum is currently standing in like, <laughs> what can he do nothing Oh, I just, just a silly, silly story. But well, I feel that this is the beginning of the end for either Callum in the police force or Balam or possibly both. Um, because, <laughs> no, because it's well, it's like right. So this is now presumably heading in the direction where Ben and Callum, when Ben and Phil are going to find out about what Callum has been doing, and it's not going to go well for Callum, is it? He's asked Jack to cover it all up, but I don't. As you say, I don't know how Jack could Ever conceivingly that. achieve that. Yeah, because Gaffney is Jack's superior anyway isn't he but i don't think that jack has any way of stopping gaffney from doing anything really unless he reports him but then at the same time the second that that report button is pressed then gaffney can return with yeah well callum's done da 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 and there so it doesn't work for callum whatever happens from this point onwards i i don't i don't know the tier system as it were for for <laughs> tier three <laughs> tier three yeah for for jack and di uh, gaffney i i thought they were the same i thought jack was a detective Inspector, to, I don't no, know. No, I got the impression that they. I thought they had a brief conversation where it implied it was implied that Scaffney was above Jack in the police. But anyway, it doesn't uh. really matter. Either way, it doesn't make a difference to the fact that Callum can't get out of this now. He's no. effectively no. now in a sort of situation that has no way of stopping until it all crashes. Yeah, I, I just, I just think that this would be a nice way of getting Callum out of the police force. <laughs> <laughs> Stop this whole ridiculous story of Callum wanting to be a policeman because it's clearly not working. And it, it, for me, it felt like it was just a means of doing this storyline anyway, where the spying on the Mitchells, I feel like this whole, st the whole Callum wanting to join the police force story was basically so they could have that story happening. I just, just don't care. <laughs> like, no. I know it's just it's I know. It I mean I don't I'm I'm guessing that I'm not going to get all I wanted from this story with Ben 
having to be arrested by Callum. That's all I wanted. <laughs> when yeah, Callum yeah. became a policeman, that's all I ever wanted from the story. I'm not even getting that. So it's it's to me, it's kind of I'm looking forward to sort of seeing the eventual fallout of when Ben and Phil find out what Callum's been up to, because presumably that is then going to bring Stuart into the fray as well, because he wouldn't actually be there as Callum's defender. So you've got that to look forward to. So <laughs> it's just sort of waiting for uh, it all to kind of fall apart now. Lovely. Well, I'm falling apart now, so uh, I, I think we need. <laughs> I think uh, I think we need to just quickly read a few comments of people have sent to us on our Twitter yes. and our social media and so forth. So we're yes. going to seamlessly move into I ain't want to gossip. And you know me, I ain't want to gossip. So after. A breakdown of the week. We read out your comments that you sent to us on our Twitter, our Instagram and our Facebook group pages, details of which will be mentioned at the end of the show. But we're starting off with at Postmodern Sleaze on Twitter, who says the New Year's Eve and day episodes have been a marked improvement of the show of EastEnders and can still do the kind of old fashioned character led episodes it used to do. It's a shame that the plot that they had to get us here was so wonky, but these two episodes were A plus after a rough few months. Mm. I agree with everything. Yeah, no, I agree there. And I'd say that actually now this mix story is in a much more watchable place than it was a couple of weeks back where it was literally just the whole the same thing going around in circles. Like, I get it. I get the path it had to take to sort of get to where it is now. It could have been down a slightly better track than it was take, than it was to get us where it's the amazing place we got to on New Year's Day. Because from here now, it's going to be about Mix told Linda what's happened. So they're now a, a solid unit taking on Katie. Frankie will come back and that will be taken. So at some point, we won't have seen the last of Katie either. So it's now going to be them versus Katie, which immediately sounds more interesting than sort of Mick just being broody and kind of lashing out at people around him. It's in, it's nice that Mick's now got his team behind him, you know, mm. Linda and hopefully... Hopefully do, Shirley. Hopefully Shirley. I'm sure, no, 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 definitely Shirley, actually. After the, again, I didn't mention it really, but that lovely scene between Shirley and Mick as well in the Vic before the New Year's Eve episode. But do you think Frankie's going to take Mick's side or do you think Frankie's going to be a bit um, torn? Well, I feel like, I don't know. Well, no, because the thing is, she's now been lied to twice, hasn't she? Mm-hmm. You know, they've originally she was really angry about the fact that like well she was originally angry about the what turned out to be the truth, and then she was told that what she now believed to be the truth wasn't the truth. So she's now been lied to twice, and now it's going to be told again that what she the horrific thought that she originally thought about her mum was in fact true. So yeah, Frankie's got a uh, a bit of a journey to go on, I think, before she can really accept Mick as her father. Mm, poor Frankie. Uh, Rachel Richardson on Facebook says, about New Year's, best episode from EastEnders in a long, long time. The scene where Linda pieces together what happened almost had me in tears. That was an emotional roller coaster of an episode and a great way to start the year. Absolutely. Mm, I mean, this is just, as I say, this is a high and it can only go down from... No, I joke. <laughs> it, it, I, I think this is... They need to keep to that peak now. Just keep... I, I don't expect every episode to be a New Year's Day episode, but just... Remember your roots now. Just kind of stick, try to stick to it. And also, mm. this, as you said, that guy who wrote the episode was it? Um, uh, Kevin Rundle, I think. His Kevin name Rundle. Is. I mean, as you say, for someone who'd only written three episodes prior to this, <laughs> wow, yes. yeah. wow, well done, Kevin. I'd love, yeah. to, I'd love to know. Um, I'd love to know his roots in the show. Whether he's like a fanatic. Um, I can tell you, he oh. was a uh, story producer at one point. He also went on to be one of the top hunt shows of Hollyoaks at one point before he came back to EastEnders. Um, oh, we had so much hope. <laughs> yeah, right. But no, if, if any, if if New Year's Day is anything to go by, his name on the writers' credits should guarantee a good episode. So no pressure, Kev. Yeah, we're but, keeping uh, <laughs> an eye on you, Kevin. Don't yeah, let us down. Kevin. We've got you. We've got you penciled as the next Simon Ashdown. So You're in our sights. You, <laughs> you can contact us on Twitter, Instagram at Warford Weekly, Facebook Warford Weekly Podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to like, subscribe, click the hell out the bell to get notifications about our spoiler videos. You can also listen to us on Apple, Podbean, Spotify, any of your favourite podcast sites. I have an email address, robwolfordweekly at gmail.com, or you can contact the other guy at alexwolfordweekly at gmail.com for general abuse and complaint. If you guys have any ideas of some a game I could play with Rob, then I would love to see <laughs> it come clean. to Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> not, not strip EastEnders or anything like that. But I, I'd love to hear your suggestions, so do send them to me on my email address. Um, You know, make them as cryptic as you like, because we like to see Rob squirm. And please do not forget to be safe, be kind, take care of each other. Have a very happy new year. Happy new year, Alec. Happy Hogmanay. Happy Hogmanay, you Scottish person. And we will speak to you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.